Hello guys, uh, I'm going to chomp right down on this SM58. Seems to work better. But this uh, mic stand is fucked, so... One sec. Uh, so yeah, storytelling and cinema, why do we do it? Um, first of all, the last time I spoke uh, at the Year Sessions, I spoke about industry matters relating to my workplace. But this time, I think it's appropriate to approach some more theoretical ground. Um, so one of the, the problems that I have with film theory at the moment is that it insists upon, or many insist upon, uh, speaking foremost about that which sets film apart from other storytelling arts. But I think that still the thing that matters to people the most is the story. And, uh, and what they come out of the cinema talking about is how immersion in narrative affected them. And this has stood us quite well throughout history. So I'm going to suggest a few ideas about why we tell stories, what it does for us, and use some cinema as examples for each point that I make. So um, we're going to start with something that seems bleedingly obvious, but... Uh, when we tell narratives, we are basically sharing our perception on a series of causal events. And this has been fundamentally adaptive in a Darwinian sense. Um, first of all, uh, say you lived thousands of years ago, you, uh, you saw your uncle eat some berries, vomit and die. And your friend was about to eat some of the same berries and you wanted to tell a little story to this friend. You, you were going to say... Uh, Hey, well, I saw my uncle, he ate those berries and died. It's a series of causal events that you tell, and it's, uh, and it's very useful to have that information. Of course, your friend can still choose to read that narrative as just your perception or just uh, a, a perspective on what is real and take their chances with the berries, but good luck to them. Um, so you have uh, probably the feature documentary might be a good example of, of this particular narrative function. I was thinking of going with American Splendor, but I thought that less of you might have seen uh, this film, Teenage Paparazzo, which is probably one of the best films uh, examining contemporary uh, filmmaking society and storytelling society, as well as celebrity culture that I've seen, and I highly re recommend that you check it out. So another error that I think that film, uh, film theory often makes is to suggest that the claim that somebody makes or a group of people make when they, when they put together a film is that uh, the claim is uh, this is what is real, this is what is normal, this is what normal people look like. But that's not necessarily always the case. I think that uh, it's also a claim about what is worthy of our attention and certain phenomena that are wor worthy of our attention. So... Um, not only can film be a springboard to discussion about what is real, it's also two hours of your time commandeering your attention. And I could have chosen to, say, make a film about another story, another, uh, another theme, but I've said that this is actually worthy of your attention. And that's probably the largest claim that's being made when you make a particular film about something. Uh, this is a largely forgotten film from the 1980s, the early 1980s, by a director, Roger Spotterswood. Um, Under Fire looks at the Nicaraguan Revolution of 1979. And particularly, uh, photojournalist's involvement in the uh, unfolding of events there, and how his lens craft, basically, uh, and, and how he directs attention uh, through his lens craft, uh, affects the events of the revolution. It's another great film. <laughs> Um, but these concepts get even more complicated when we talk about retellings of history. Because basically what history is, is a series of little stories which distill cause and effect to a few understandable things. So uh, it's ab obviously been very, very useful for us to be able to recount stories of things before us so that we're more able to make decisions uh, going ahead. Um, but obviously no events are monocausal, so we have to choose those causes and events that we think are most important to pay attention to. And that's what history is. Uh, a couple of films here. Um, the first one, Outsourced, is uh, a rom-com, and I fucking love rom-coms. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's considering and trying to understand uh, something that's happening at the moment and trying to record it, which is the globalization of the labor market. Whereas the second film is a Ken Loach film, uh, Land and Freedom, which is looking at the 1930s civil uh, war in Spain. 
And the interesting thing about this film is that it manages to be both didactic and complex at the same time. It's didactic about the wedge politics uh, employed by Franco, but it has a compl complex understanding of those politics and, uh, and actually portrays a complex understanding of the cause and event. Now, that's obviously not the only thing that films can do or stories can do. They can also upset our understanding of causal structures. They can confound us. They can surprise us. They can offer uh, events that don't make sense following one another. Um, and basically what this does for us, uh, for anybody who's uh, going to accept the fact that we don't know what the fuck we're doing here or why anything works the way it does, uh, it makes us feel gratified and less alone that somebody else also understands enough to represent this that uh, things don't make sense and so neither should films. And as Louis Bunuel is less of a misogynistic prick than David Lynch, I've gone with the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, which is a great example of cinema of the absurd. Uh, check it out. Now, this is, uh, this is something that's close to my heart. Uh, empathy. Um, more and more today, we have uh, to make decisions that are going to affect people that we never meet. From the polling booth to the supermarket, our decisions are going to affect a wide range of people who are in circumstances that we'll never experience. And we're going to need means of being able to empathize with them, to see them as ethical subjects that we should take into consideration when we make those decisions. And, su and as such, we create uh, hypothetical characters and those hypothetical characters uh, basically exist so that we can imagine ourselves in somebody else's uh, circumstance and imagine somebody else's experience so that we'll make better decisions if we're going to be able to affect them. Uh, I, I want to make one more point about this, which is that, um, that this is a really, really powerful function of storytelling and it is not always used, as I might be suggesting, for common good. You might like to consider the case of the movie Top Gun, which received conditional assistance from the US Navy, or here in Australia, Red Dog, which was partially leveraged by uh, the Australian mining industry, um, and both wanted us to feel more generously about their operations uh, by focusing attention on the humanity of their workforce. Kim's nodding furiously down here in the front. She wants to get this point across too. Uh, this, is a, this is a film I just wrote my thesis on, don't want to talk about anymore. Uh, <laughs> It's Casadell's Babies by John Sayles, and you'll just have to believe me that it's a good example of empathy in film. Um, this this all also might seem quite obvious, but film offers us a way to talk about ethics. Um, but what you might not have considered is that film uh, and, and all story and all narrative, if it involves living things, is basically relying on morality and relying on our interest in morality for drama. If you take even the crudest soap opera on television, the basic principle is, you know, that person slept with that person, that person slept with that, that person, therefore that person is bad, that person is good. Everything is actually about morality and ethics when you start talking about story. Um, obviously, you know, you, you, you needn't just uh, uh, indulge one's predilection for, uh, for morality and you needn't just um, reinforce what people already believe about morality. It is possible also to offer greyer moral and ethical subject matter, um, as does this German film, The White Messiah, uh, which is pro probably something... It's a film about cultural relativity that probably couldn't have been made in Hollywood because of how uncompromising it is about the questions that it asks. And, uh, and it doesn't offer any opportunity for us to feel indulged because we are reminded of what we already know about ethics and morality. Leading on from this, we've got enacting. Uh, so we can also play out ethical responses to social problems through narrative by putting a character in the same situation. There's a theatre director, Augusto Boal, in Brazil who uses uh, theatre in Parliament to legislate. Basically what he does is he puts on a theatre production that presents a social problem, he invites people from the street to then act out a response to that social dilemma, and, and then the improvisers who they're acting with uh, see where it takes them. And this is obviously possible for all stories to do, and it is what we do when we put uh, any character into a situation where they have to make a moral decision. They basically live it out and see how it works for them. 
Uh, this is Lindsay Anderson's second film in the Mick Travis trilogy, uh, Oh Lucky Man, where Malcolm McDowell plays Mick Travis, who is basically sampling episodically a number of different ways of living in capitalist Britain, and unsurprisingly, all of the ways that he samples uh, have problems leading back to capitalism itself. But it's, it's a lot more complex than I'm making out here, and worthy of your attention also. Uh, it's, it's time to talk about death. Uh, uh, because death is obviously a large part of storytelling and a large part of everything that we do. In fact, uh, so in our day-to-day -day lives now, uh, we rarely have the opportunity to respond to immediate threats to our mortality. But that seems to be very, very important to us. Um, and in fact, that's pretty much all we know how to do is to survive, to help others survive, and then to keep surviving, basically. Uh, and if we are robbed of that opportunity to feel that uh, threat to our mortality, then we create reasons to feel it. And thence uh, we create drama uh, that makes us feel alive. Uh, the heart pounding that you might get from a film such as Clute, uh, which has probably the purest representation in performance of absolute fear that I've seen out of anyone, and that's Jane Fonda. It also has great snot acting. Um, has, has anyone seen the film? Yeah, there's a few nods in the audience. You know what I mean. Uh, everybody else who doesn't know what I mean by snot acting should watch Clute because it's amazing <laughs> snot acting. Uh, which, which segues nicely into horror. Um, one of the things that seems apparent to me about ho horror is that it's a good way of testing the validity of our fears. And when we're born, basically, we're, we're born with uh, the capacity for a wide set of fears that basically get culled as we live through experiences where they're not relevant anymore. Uh, I was once afraid of monsters uh, in my youth. I watched a lot of monster movies. I survived through those monster movies. Now I realize monsters aren't that much of a thing, probably not worth worrying about, except when I uh, go to the toilet at night, in which case, you know, it's possible one might jump out and... That still happens to me. Uh, anyway, uh, horror comedy is obviously very good for this, and An American Wealth in London is the horror comedy by which I think all horror comedies should be judged. Um, this, is, this is getting rather theoretical and anecdotal now, but um, I also think, gosh, I'm talking quickly because I have so many of these to, f to fill in. Uh, I, this is probably going to be a very unsatisfying speech because you're thinking in your head, oh, I can think of many more reasons for telling stories, but I'm not going to cover them all. Anyway, this is one I am going to cover. Uh, horror, I think, has, uh, has an effect of feeling less alone because somebody else feels as angry about other people as you do. Uh, now, let me explain this. I, I think that... Uh, Anecdotally, a lot of the gentlest people that I know seem to be into the most violent content. And also, uh, when you're growing up, it seems that when you have less facility with language to express that which really frustrates you about other human beings, there seems to be a, a great release in being able to see humanity slaughtered on a film. Uh, Consider also the recent zombie fad, and I have a number of uh, friends who are into zombie movies. And I asked one of these friends how they feel at the apocalyptic end of one where zombies are pretty much everybody. And he said that he felt rather cleansed and that he felt uh, a lot more calm at the end of one of those films. And I kind of understand where he's coming from. Uh, there is something about having, uh, having that shared experience of, yeah, I, I can't express this kind of anger, but sometimes I really want to kill everyone, and it's not that bad if we just do it there on the film. Uh, I, I, I'm not really into zombie movies, but um, unless they're funny, I, I like the funny ones. This, this one, Pontypool, however, is less funny. It's also Canadian and interesting, and if you are into zombie movies and haven't seen it, uh, I recommend that one. I, I'm speaking quickly because I'm probably not, uh, I don't have that much time, but The Fall is a good example of a fantasy movie, and I'll discuss escapism instead because they're quite similar phenomena. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, a, lot, a lot gets made of escapism and how we go to films to escape. And when I ask people the question, you know, why do we tell stories? That's uh, uh, the largest response that I get is, oh, you know, we need to escape every now and then. 
but I'd like you to consider how you feel when you emerge from a movie. And there is this, uh, this sensation that, uh, that you're quite glad to be back in life. Now, everybody has uh, a different threshold for how much film they can take. Uh, some people can sit through a whole day of films, but I think for most people it's just one film. And then afterwards, there is this kind of sense of relief that you're returning to something with such nuance and complexity of life. And I think that this remains true of all escapist cinema, including kind of worlds that we might want to live in, such as, you know, a romance or a fantasy film, is that despite all of that, it is a way of comparatively appreciating the real because it's quite nice to return to th to somewhere where you do have problems to consider. And that is Galaxy Quest, enough said. Uh, <laughs> so a lot, a lot has been written on spectacle and, uh, and, and the experience of spectatorship and special effects, but the point I want to make here is that what we're doing when we're ogling at special effects is basically ogling at human invention and what we've been able to achieve. And I think this is the same of all spectacle, including cinema, inc including like a massive production that you might go and see. The resounding kind of effect is, wow, that's immense. Virtual kind of pat on the back for being a human and being able to achieve something of such immensity. Um, I also think that Terry Gilliam's use of special effects is underrated. Uh, the first film here, The Brothers Grimm, is a genre scramble. The, the latter, Dr. Panassus, is a moral scramble, and both basically use special effects to confound towards those ends. Um, getting towards the end now, we also go and see films and participate in stories because it makes us feel clever to recognize how we're supposed to respond in them. Uh, so I think everybody has had that experience of sitting in a darkened cinema, wanting to be immersed in a film where somebody nearby is pointing out the bleeding obvious, such as, you know, oh, he shouldn't go in there, he shouldn't do that, or, you know, oh, that's gross, whatever. Um, probably not uh, with my vocal inflection, probably something quite different to that. But, um, uh, but basically what they're doing is, is vocalizing what I think a lot of people are going to going through, which is that sense of knowing how to respond. Because we have to think of cinema as the same as practically every other ritual that human beings do. If you were to take, for example, a funeral uh, where people have a number of procedures that they follow, and the procedures don't have any inherent meaning in and of themselves, but they do give you like something to do that will make you feel more comforted because you know what to do. And the same is true of cinema. You know how to respond because the movie gives you cues, and you feel clever for that, and you feel comforted by that. Uh, and this is the same thing is true when a film is breaking with convention. When a film is breaking with convention, it's basically saying you do understand these conventions, so you know how they're being uh, broken. So therefore, you are you, you are clever for having known them in the first place, which isn't that different, really. Uh, Chunking Express, a Wong Kar Wai film, is uh, is very unique in the way that it breaks with convention. Uh, Kind of halfway through, it employs a repetitive narrative structure, which shouldn't work, but does. And if you haven't seen it, that's another one to check out. And lastly, the real reason that most of us participate in any art and any story is really to feel closer to one another, which is the point that I've been making again and again. Whether it be uh, sitting in the dark in a cinema with a bunch of other people and responding as one, whether it be common knowledge of a film, a celebrity, a genre, a cult around a film, whether it be, uh, whether it be any, any number of the reasons that we feel closer together when we see a film, uh, basically that's what we're trying to achieve. And this last one's for our first speaker, Kim. Um, that's, that's exactly what The Room does. It basically develops a culture around knowing how bad cinema can be, and we feel good about being amongst another, uh, a, a number of people who also know how bad cinema can be. Uh, uh, wait, that's a lie. That's not the end. I do want to say, uh, say lastly that uh, I, I want to reiterate that basically this is by no means an exhaustive list of the things that cinema can do, but it's what I could come up with in the time speaking very, very fast to you all. Thank you very much. Brilliant.